It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Global warming trends continued in 2017. Two new reports out, one by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. According to the NASA Earth's global surface, temperatures ranked in 2017 as the second warmest, but second only to global temperatures in 2016. In the NOAA study, it concluded that 2017 was the third warmest year in their record keeping. The minor difference in the rankings is due to the different methods used by the two agencies to analyze global temperatures. Well, what is the significance of this warming temperature pattern we are seeing? Let's ask Bob Henson, meteorologist and journalist with Weather Underground. He is the author of the Thinking Person's Guide to Climate Change. Good to have you on, Bob. Uh, very nice to be here. So, Bob, uh, NASA and NOAA reports uh, show that 2017 is the second or the third year on record that's the, been the warmest, although um, it was not an El Nino year. So tell us what this means. That's actually a pretty significant part of the of today's report. Some it turns out that when we have an El Nino going on, it actually warms the global atmosphere. And that can be anywhere from a year to maybe a couple of years. And just for a little background, El Nino is when there's a warming of the uh, ocean temperatures over the uh, eastern tropical Pacific, kind of around the Galapagos and offshore of Peru and Ecuador. But the warming can cover a huge area, um, bigger than the United States. And so as that warm water sends heat into the atmosphere, it, it kind of propagates and reverberates around a big chunk of the globe. So in addition to kind of torquing weather patterns, it actually pumps heat from the ocean into the atmosphere. And the opposite happens when we have La Nina going on. That's a cooling in that same area. And the heat goes from the atmosphere more into the ocean. So that's kind of an uh, up and down the cycle that modulates this long-term uh, warming we have going on globally because of greenhouse gases. Now, what we typically expect is that it'll be warmer during the El Nino years, cooler during La Nina years, but the global trend is upward. In this case, this was the warmest year we've ever had without an El Nino uh, kind of goosing the temperatures. Right. And when did we first see this uh, record-breaking global temperature trend beginning? Well, it's been going on for the better part of a century, really. Um, we had what was called, sometimes called the Little Ice Age uh, period in, uh, centered kind of in the 1700s, 1800s, where global temperatures were quite cold. And uh, that was when we had things like uh, frost fairs on the Thames River in London because it froze over regularly. Uh, that's when uh, President George Washington uh, crossed the Delaware on ice. And it was just generally colder, especially in uh, North American Europe. But uh, since the night, around 1900, it's been warming globally. And that trend has accelerated in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And the last four years have all been the four warmest on record. So we have seen another little blip upwards in this uh, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward process. Right. And is this what scientists expected to see from the amount of, say, greenhouse gases that have accumulated on, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere? It is. We expected to see global temperatures rising uh, more or less at the, at the rate they are now. Of course, temperatures aren't going to rise a, a precise amount every year. Uh, the projections that have been made through computer models that take into account the gases we put into the atmosphere and all sorts of other things, those models predicted a rise of several degrees Celsius unfolding over this current century. Uh, it could be as low as maybe two or three degrees uh, Fahrenheit or as high as five, six, seven degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we've already warmed in the last century um, close to a, a degree and a half Fahrenheit. And if you look at how much carbon dioxide we put into the air, it's roughly on par with what we would have expected. So uh, in a sense, uh, what we're getting right now is right on target with what we would expect. Now, we can't predict how these ups and downs of El Nino or La Nina will unfold. Uh, we, you know, it wasn't really foreseen that temperatures would slow down in their rise a little bit uh, over the 2000s and then pick up again this decade. 
Uh, that has a lot to do with whether heat is going mostly into the, well, it's always going mostly into the ocean. It's only a small part that goes into the atmosphere. And so that change in, in that amount going to the atmosphere is partially what gives us the, the blips in that up and down, but mostly up curve. Right. So, all right, let's get to the crux of the issue. What are the implications of what NASA and NOAA are saying about uh, the trends we are seeing? Well, obviously, the implications are what we care about most, and uh, they're, they're widespread. Um, the, the first and most obvious is that it's getting warmer. So uh, where you have things like heat waves going on, uh, there's going to be a tendency for those heat waves to be, be worse, more intense. Um, we do know a lot about how to cope with heat waves, um, especially in the United States. You know, the, the death toll from heat waves has gone down in recent uh, last 10 or 20 years because we've done things like open cooling centers. So that's a good example of adapting to climate change. Unfortunately, not all of the world is well equipped to do that. So uh, we can expect heat waves to, to take serious tolls in other parts of the world, especially. Now, that's the, uh, the most obvious thing. We talk about global warming, but it actually affects precipitation as much or more than temperature. The main way it does this is by uh, kind of goosing the hydrologic cycle so that uh, when it rains in many parts of the world, it's tending to be heavier rain. Uh, but when it's droughty, the, the drought can sometimes be more intense in its impacts uh, because with higher temperatures, you're pulling more moisture out of that dry soil. So unfortunately, both ends of the hydrologic spectrum get affected. A drought, drought impacts can be more intense and heavy rains can be more, more extreme and heavier. Uh, we've seen some of that play out this year. You know, the uh, intense hurricanes, most particularly Hurricane Harvey in Texas, which produced the heaviest hurricane-related rain we've uh, ever recorded in the U.S. At the same time, you've had some very intense droughts going on in different parts of the world. And we have drought returning to the United States right now over the last month or two. So those are the main impacts. There's others, uh, impacts on storm intensity and so forth. But the further we get from uh, temperature and, and precipitation, uh, the harder it is to separate the signal from the noise because you naturally have a lot of variability in things like tornadoes. It would be very hard to suss out a climate change signal there. Right. Now, what we are seeing out in California where drought is causing wildfires, uh, which are causing, uh, I guess, more atmospheric changes and then heavy rains and mudslides, is this a implications of what NOAA and NASA is telling us? Well, California is kind of at the epicenter in the U.S. for the kinds of drought impacts we can expect with a warming climate. California is just coming off of a vicious uh, uh, drought that went all the way from 2011 uh, into 2016. Uh, fortunately, 2016-17, that winter brought, brought very substantial rains uh, all over the western U.S. Ironically, those heavy rains uh, help lead to the wildfires because they fostered a growth in the, the underbrush that then dried out in, in the summer of 2017. Now, it's normal to, to have dry summers in 2017 in California. That's just the way that their climate works. Um, we're, fortunately, we're starting to see a little more rain and snow just kicking in the last few days in California. So we may not go back into that five-year drought. But all indications are that when it is dry in California, when we have the droughts like we just had for five years, then the temperatures are going to be much warmer than they have been in previous droughts. In other words, uh, even if the rainfall doesn't change, the droughts are going to be more impactful, uh, harder to deal with, harder on agriculture, harder on water storage because snow is going to disappear and melt off more, more rapidly. Some of it will evaporate. So California has its hands full in dealing with drought um, but, and at the same time, being ready for the uh, occasional uh, intense rains that where it's, for example, recently burned, you can have very serious mudslides. So uh, it's a lot to deal with. Uh, and California is fortunately very, very proactive in looking at it and dealing with it. But uh, that may not be the case in uh, other parts of the Southwest and other parts of the United States. Right. Now, um... President Trump, of course, now famously tweeted that uh, on New Year's Eve, he wrote a good old global warming. Where is it on uh, this particular New Year's Eve? Um, was that cold weather consistent with the pattern of global warming? Well, there's some research in this area on whether the Northeast U.S. and the Midwest are becoming prone to occasional bouts of really cold weather as a result of climate change. And uh, there's quite a bit of debate on this within the science community. It's not at all an accepted thing. There's some evidence that we have tended toward patterns in recent years where it's very warm and dry in the West, 
and then the jet stream is pushed up and then kicks down over the eastern U.S. and brings down cold air. We've had some pretty dramatic examples of that. Um, certainly the cold wave at the end of 2017, start of 2018 is a vivid example. And there have been a couple others, but there have also been examples of very dramatic winter warmth. Um, uh, March of 2012 was what we call the, the uh, great winter warm wave. Uh, temperatures up near 80 and uh, near 90, even in as far north as Michigan, which is really crazy for March. So it's not been a consistent tendency toward colder weather in the, in the Midwest and Northeast. There have been these occasional episodes. And so researchers trying to figure out if things like a loss of sea ice in the Arctic might be related to this weirding or kinking of the jet stream. But regardless, uh, what we do expect in the long run is winters are generally going to be warmer. Uh, we're not going to see as many of these kinds of episodes going forward, especially looking ahead decades. Right. Uh, so certainly when we're in the middle of them, they're pretty intense and tough to deal with. But uh, no, global change is warming the, the globe and warming the United States, uh, regardless of these episodes. Right. And, and uh, will uh, the shift and changes that are taking place, will it become more difficult to predict whether patterns as Earth's atmosphere alters and um, with the rising temperatures we are seeing um, in terms of modeling? And because so much of our preparedness to deal with this stuff comes from the predictions. That's a very good point. Uh, a good example of that is uh, in floods, where we have prepared societies in different cities, for example, to deal with a particular level of flood water. And often that's called a 100-year flood because it's on average over a long, long time period, you would tend to get that amount of rain or that amount of flooding uh, once every 100 years. The challenge is those statistics are assuming that the climate is stationary, right? Uh, that we have a fixed climate and uh, those expectations aren't going to change. Well, in fact, uh, we don't have a stationary climate. We have a warming climate. And that's also leading to more extreme rainfall, as we, we mentioned a few minutes ago. So um, that means that a hundred year, what used to be a hundred year rainfall or a hundred year flood may become a 50 year rainfall or 50 year flood. So uh, cities are indeed going to have to look ahead and be prepared for perhaps bigger floods than they're used to as a result of rainfall. In addition, on the coastlines, we're talking about sea level rise, and, and that is obviously exacerbating uh, storm surge as well as what we call nuisance flooding, which can just be triggered by a, a, a moon phase. So all these things are changing expectations. Fortunately, weather itself is becoming uh, better and better predicted. You know, Our ability to predict storms and such, uh, as computer models improve, we can go further out into the future and, and have more confidence in where storms are headed. And we have a good sense of the kinds of changes to expect from climate change and things like these heavier rains, more intense heat waves. So in some sense, we're better able to predict uh, the kinds of weather and climate coming up, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's translating into predicting the, the outcomes, especially when it comes to, say, flooding, where it's also affected by where people live. We have all these uh, compounding uncertainties that uh, do make it hard to uh, look forward societally. Hmm. We've been speaking with Bob Henson, meteorologist and journalist with Weather Underground. He's the author of The Thinking Person's Guide to Climate Change. Bob, good to have you with us. Great to be here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.